Welcome to the 76 Capital Leadership Series. My name is Wayne Kimmel, and I'm your host and managing partner of 76 Capital. And on this show, as you know, I interview top sports entrepreneurs, athletes, executives who are truly changing and shaping the sports industry. And I want to just give a quick shout out to our producer back at the station, James, doing a great job, always pushing all the right buttons and doing everything um, to make this show work. Follow James at James Santor. He's a great follow. And you can also follow me at Wayne, at Wayne Kimmel across all the social media networks. And if you are an entrepreneur and you are truly trying to do the next, next thing in the sports industry, reach out to us at 76 Capital across all the same social media networks, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, uh, Instagram. Great way for you to, to get in touch and learn about all the things that we do. And of course, subscribe to our podcast on our 76 Capital Leadership Series. Um, and you know you can also find our podcast on IGTV and YouTube. And let's get right to it today. I mean, we have an amazing guest. We have Ali Bedroya. I'm really excited to bring you on onto the, onto the show, Ali. I mean, you are the captain of the Philadelphia Union. You're now also the new co-chairman of our 76 Capital Athlete Venture Group, working with Brian Westbrook, the chair, and Chad Stender, my partner. Really excited to have you on our 76 Capital Leadership Series. Ali, welcome to our 76 Capital Leadership Series. Thank you, Wayne. Thanks for having me. You know, I'm excited to work together with you and, and everybody at the 76 Capital, and I'm really looking forward to what the future has to bring. Well, we're excited to have you and excited to have you as you know to, and talk with you on our on our show, um, which is something that you know, we're really excited about what we what we've been able to do. I mean, we've now done close to 60 different interviews with entrepreneurs and athletes and executives within the sports world and talking to them about not only just what they're doing today, but their background and how they got to where they are today. So I'd love to do that with you as well and and really learn from, you know, you know, from you, like, where did you grow up and what did you do as a kid and what kind of brought to you brought you to where you are today? Yeah, a little bit about my background. Uh, my parents are from Colombia. Uh, both my parents, you know, they moved to, uh, to the States. Uh, when my father was about 19 years old, he came over actually on a scholarship for soccer. Uh, and then my mom followed suit soon thereafter. Um, and they actually settled in New Jersey. Uh, that's where I was born in Englewood, North Jersey, you know, pretty much just across the bridge, George Washington from, uh, from New York City. Um, so I was, I lived there until I was about nine years old and, uh, due to my father's work, you know, he traveled often to Latin America, you know, Central America, South America. Uh, obviously it made more sense to travel out of Miami, uh, than, uh, up in New York. So we tra uh, we moved down there. Uh, and then I pretty much grew up, was raised down in South Florida outside of Fort Lauderdale. And, um, you know, I think that's. A lot of my roots, you know, my friends give me a lot of stick for, you know, when my hometown appears in, in a bro TV broadcast, it always fluctuates between, you know, Anglewood, New Jersey or Western Florida. And, you know, they're like, you got to pick one or the other. But uh, I like that I represent both North Jersey and South Florida. You know, they I hold them dear to, to me. And um, uh, yeah, I, I grew up pretty much playing all kinds of sports. You know, I was involved in, in tennis and baseball and in soccer, obviously, specifically and, and basketball. And, you know, I think all those sports helped me to become the, the player and the person that I am today. That's amazing. I mean, to have, you know, your you said your, your mom and dad, you know, both both played played soccer. I mean, what was it like, you know, your, your dad as a professional soccer player being a kid, you know, being able to kind of watch your dad as, as a pro must have been must have been amazing. Yeah, it was great. You know, I can remember those days in North Jer Jersey. I mean, those who are familiar with the, the like the soccer scene up there, uh, you know, my, my father would, would would be representing like the Brooklyn Italians or, you know, the Greeks, uh, you know, I played for all these sectors, the Colombians, you know, uh, and, and then after the games, you know, I, I remember there'd always be like a little parties at, at like diners, the local diners or, or restaurants. And then I remember being a little kid and going playing with the other young kids there as well and just you know, kind of grubbing out, you know, eating, you know, all the barbecue food and, and the amazing food. And, you know, obviously the parents would have adult beverages, but, it, you know, for me, I got a, I got a look early, uh, you know, all kind of like the, the traveling that was done as a professional or as a, as an athlete and, you know, the opportunities those presented and kind of the ability to, you know, meet new people or, or, you know, go to different cities, different places and, and see new things. So, uh, you know, I kind of enjoyed that part of it. 
That's that's really cool. I mean, and and then you know how how did you you know decide? I mean, I believe right now you know for the Philadelphia Union, um, you I believe you're a midfield midfielder. Is that right? Correct. Yes, midfielder. Now, did you always play midfielder? Or were you you know what was what, where did you sort of grow up and playing what? Yeah, yeah. For the most part, throughout my career, uh, I've always played as a midfielder. Uh, I've been a, a pretty versatile player, so that's why I just specifically say right uh, midfielder, just because you know I can play on the right side, I can play in the left, down the middle. I also played some, you know, like right back, uh, defender, right wing, whatever you want to call it. And, and sometimes throughout even my professional career, I played like a, what they call like a false striker, false number nine, like you know, which is like um, the player that plays just behind the striker. Um, and, you know, with my ability to make runs and off the ball movement and things like that. Um, obviously, when you're younger and you're kind of one of the better players, you know, you kind of just you're like the offensive player, you know, just a free roll, go wherever, try to find the ball, get the ball to find you and make things happen. Um, that was kind of how I was in college and stuff like that. So, but, you know, I've always, you know, I've, it's just my passion. You know, I, I love to, to play, make things happen. Um, I consider myself. Well, I guess like an honest player, you know, a guy that's willing to do all the dirty work, you know, defensively as well as offensively. Um, and, you know, that's allowed me to have the career that I've had so far. That's amazing. And I have to ask, I mean, did, did you ever in your career think about playing goalie? Did I ever in my career? No, no, not, not seriously. You know, there'd be times in training where you joke around, like, give me the gloves, I'll hop in goal and then for fun. But never. No, I think it's too boring to play goalie. <laughs> I, I don't know if it was too boring, if it was a different kind of mindset you need to have to be able to go back there. Because I mean, today's goalies, I mean, they're putting their face in there. I mean, they're, they're it's 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 pretty it's pretty crazy. With yeah, I always joke with them. I always give them a hard time because I think with the goalies, like you say, different mindset. They're they're characters, you know. They're different personalities. You got you got to be. <laughs> Uh, that's great. So after, you know, you said after growing up in New Jersey and then um, also as well as, you know, growing up down in, in, in the Florida area, um, you went off to college. Um, did you go, was it a college scholarship or did you walk on or how did that work? Yeah, initially I got a scholarship. Uh, I actually, you know, kind of long story short, my father was initially came to the States because he had a scholarship to Boston College, but that ended up um, not happening and he ended up getting picked up by Fairleigh Dickinson. Um, and then how it worked out with me is, you know, I was, I played on a great club team, you know, in Weston, we were a great club team, you know, went to nationals, we were, had some great players, but I never got a, a real um, uh, kind of 100% full scholarship to one of the big schools that I wanted to go to. Like my dream school was UNC, like to become a Tar Heel. Uh, to play in the ACC, one of those schools. I never got that offer. I got like, you know, half scholarship and things like that. So Fairleigh Dickinson actually was one of the schools, I guess, based on the relationship with my father um, that offered me a full ride. And, you know, kind of, you know, they were uh, committed to have me come in, play as a freshman. So I, I, I playing time was important for me. I wanted to make sure that I had the chance to to play because there were some schools that would even tell me that, you know, I don't see you playing as a freshman. I'm like, how can you tell me that when you haven't even seen me play or I haven't even stepped on campus, you know, you, you don't know my true ability. Um, so, you know, I went there to Fairleigh Dickinson for a year, did extremely well. And then I ended up actually in Boston College because we had faced them uh, that year and I scored like two goals on them. They're like, all right, could, would you be willing to transfer to BC? And I'm like, oh, now you want me, all right. <laughs> So uh, I made the switch to Boston College. You know, for my mom, education was always important. So BC is obviously a great school from an academic standpoint. And obviously being in the ACC, uh, I knew that that was where I wanted to be competitively um, just because they had the best uh, teams and players in the country. So, you know, I made the, the switch to BC and I loved my time there, you know, um, from a school, you know, academic standpoint and then from a playing standpoint, you know, I was able to get off offensive ACC player of the year. Um, there, my first year at BC, and we were the number one ranked team there. Um, so it was just a, a great time. And, you know, it's funny because in European soccer and European football, um, you know, you don't really have universities. You know, you go, you turn pro from an early age. You know, they have academies. Uh, obviously, that landscape has been changed here in the States now. But at that time, college was still kind of a good route to go. Um, and for me, it definitely helped me become a professional. Well, we're really excited to have you, Ali, um, on our 76 Capital Leadership Series. And you can follow Ali at um, Ali Bedoya 17 on Twitter. So make sure you follow him. Um, great following. 
as we, you know, as we're talking about your college career, you ended up in the ACC. Did you, did you knock around UNC a little bit while you were? Oh yeah. Oh yeah, definitely. The funny thing is from all the schools, you know, that I guess didn't offer me a full ride that first year when I went, I scored on every single one of those schools. Um, so it was kind of, you know, like a little revenge and I was up for it and it, it, you know, it was, it was good, but, uh, I definitely uh, performed against uh, all those schools that I, you know, I had in the back of my head, I remember them. And there were schools, you know, that when I was younger, you know, I was kind of still short, you know, skinny guy. And, you know, a lot of times I think some of those colleges, when they were scouting me, the, those were the scouting reports, you know, uh, the physically I was challenged because of my height and because they didn't see the strength of me. But we all know that doesn't matter. In soccer, at least. <laughs> Brian Westbrook would say something different. <laughs> right. We'll we'll get to Brian and, and and some of the things that he's done, but yeah, you're you're totally right. I mean, but again, he talks he talks about speed and and being able to you know and, and just also the idea of being able to just get back up no matter what, right? That's a, a huge thing. So you're you're in college, um, you're you're performing at the highest of levels in the ACC, and so was it always your dream to go from there and go pro, whether that was in the U.S. or in in Europe? What was kind of what were you thinking at the time? Yeah, it's funny. I mentioned earlier, my mother was was very keen on, you know, the academic side of things. Um, and I would say I would say I would be like I said, in Europe, you know, you're, you're kind of going to academies and at 16, 17 kids are pretty much finding out if they're going to go pro or not at that age. And for me at that age, I mean, I was seeing who my next day was at the homecoming or the prom. <laughs> you know, I wasn't really thinking about going pro. It was so I would say I consider myself a late bloomer, I guess, because it wasn't until I guess my sophomore year in college. You know, obviously my freshman year in college, I did really well. I was all American and all that, but until I got to be a part of like the Olympic uh, training camps, you know, at the under 23s, that's when it started to tick. That you know, I started getting European clubs interested in my ability and and uh, opportunities to play overseas. And that's when it started to click, like I can really make that make it happen. You know, I can really turn pro and make a career. And so, uh, yeah, with that came, you know, I could have I had the chance to leave early my junior year at BC uh, to a club in Portugal, Sporting Lisbon, which is a really good club. But my mom, you know, she she held me down, you know, and she said, you better get that scholar, uh, degree. And so I st stuck around, got in, uh, stayed in school. I got my degree, you know, I took some extra classes in each semester and stayed over in the summer and, and graduated early in December. And, and then I was able to go to Sweden and take that first step to turn professional in, uh, in January. So did you were you playing? Did you play on the U.S. national team before um, going to Europe or, or at the same time? Or how, how did that work? Yeah, I was in the mix with the with the under 20s. I went into some camps with the youth national teams and then with the under 23s, which is the kind of the Olympic team. You know, I was a part of some camps there. And so there I'm dealing with, you know, some of the players there were, were already professionals, you know. Uh, so it was a good it was a mix of uh, guys who were in college and also the guys who were already professionals. So, yeah, once you're in that mix for me, then it was like, you know, that's kind of a, a reflection of your ability and it, it kind of you know, gives you that sense that like, you know, you can hack it here, then, you, you, you know, you're a professional pretty much. Um, you have a chance. So that's when the light kind of switch turned in my head, you know, obviously that, you know, I got to uh, do well in school, but also uh, that, you know, I have the talent and the skill to, to go professional and to get prepared for that. Yeah, it's amazing. I mean, you know, from a from a U.S. national team perspective, you know, my partner, Chad, who, who you know very well, right, he, he was telling me, he's like, do you realize that Ali played 66 times for the national team? And, and I mean, like, he's like, that's unbelievable. Like you have to. And so what, what was that experience like, like playing for the, the U S national team, wearing the, you know, the flag on your, on your chest. I mean, like, what, what was that? What was that? What, what did it feel like being out there? And. Oh man, it's, it's, it's surreal. You know, I think, like I said, you, as a kid, you, you always, uh, uh, you always dream, you always watch those games, you know, the European games in my house. We watch a lot of our South American leagues too. Um, but uh, of, of playing in a World Cup, like that's the pinnacle, I feel like, of any soccer player's uh, career um, is to be able to represent your country on the biggest international stage in the world. And, and as you know, you know, here in the States, you know, I guess we see like the Super Bowl as the big spectacle and, you know, this and that. But when you really look at the numbers and data and everything, you see it, the World Cup dwarfs like every sport, any sporting event. Right. Um, so I think uh, it's just it's just surreal. You know, I actually the 2010 World Cup that was in South Africa. I was called into camp for that one. Unfortunately, I didn't make the final roster. I was an alternate there. 
but that just like you like you mentioned earlier, it, it wasn't it, it didn't really knock me down, but it, it made me realize that you know I'm so close, I need to work harder, you know I can do it. And then I was I had that chance in 2014 to to represent the U.S. at the at the World Cup in Brazil, and you know in the soccer world, Brazil has always been like kind of like the um, the the golden team, right? The, the the best players and the way the, they play the game is is so amazing to watch. So to have the world be able to play in that World Cup in Brazil and just see the uh, kind of all the eyes and kind of the pressure and the environment and everything surrounding it was just amazing, you know. And I just recall walking out in the tunnel. I couldn't even see the field just because all the cameras and the journalists that were in your face and the flashes going off before, you know, going out on the field. And uh, you hear the vuvuzelas, it's deafening the noise. And, and then you think about like, you know, all the eyes that are watching you from all over the world. It's, it's just something that it's hard to explain. And, and then, you know, obviously as, a, as an athlete, you kind of zone out, right? You, you, once you enter the field, you, you, you're just so focused on the game. And I just remember Clint Dempsey scoring that first goal against Ghana. Um, in the opening, you know, in the first five minutes or whatever it was, it was early goal and, and it was just a euphoric feeling. You know, I was, I, I literally saw the goal going like, I, you know, I wish I, I was a little bit quicker so I could tap it in. It could have been my goal, but uh, it's just a, a feeling that's unexplainable. You know, it's just um, something I've dreamt my whole life and it's, it's, it's surreal. Like I said, it's just to be able to put on that shirt, you know, the USA flag, you know, hear the national anthem being played. Um, and just, you know, know that you're out there as one of the, like, the best players in a country of, you know, well over 300 million people. It's, it's incredible. Must have been incredible. And, and you know, you, you mentioned, you know, Dempsey. I mean, who, who are some of the other guys that you played with that you, you know, maybe were there some of the guys that you kind of were, were looked up to when you were younger? Or were there some guys that you competed against and now have relationships with? I mean, have you kept, have you really kept yeah, that? Yeah, absolutely. Up? I think, um, Obviously, growing up, uh, Landon Donovan was a, a marquee figure in all of uh, U.S. soccer. You know, and he was a kid. You know, that made it as a pro very early um, in his career, and you know, he became the poster child for for U.S. soccer. So, like my first camp with like the full team, uh, I'll never forget it was in in Holland against Amsterdam. I'm uh, in sorry in Amsterdam against Holland, uh, the Netherlands. And that was the first time I got to meet guys like, you know, Landon Donovan, Clint Dempsey, you know, Tim Howard, Demarcus Beasley, all these guys. And, you know, it's, it's a little bit nerve wracking, you know, um, but at the same time, they, they were they were great to me. You know, you know, they were willing to put their arms over my shoulders and, you know, kind of um, uh, direct me in certain ways and, you know, kind of um, make the pressure less than it, than it really was. And uh, I think obviously we're playing the Netherlands also for me. That was another team that growing up, you know, they have some world-class players uh, playing in some of the biggest teams in the world. Um, so for me to step in that field in that stadium was just uh, an amazing feeling as well. And uh, another reassurance that I, I belonged, um, but also uh, just remarkable that I had made it that far, you know, <laughs> just a, like a normal kid from Jersey, from South Florida, you know, playing on this, on this stage with, with these guys. And, uh, um, to be able to play, like I said, with those names, uh, Carlos Bocanegra, uh, you know, Steve Chirondolo, Landon Donovan, Tim Howard, Demarcus Beasley, Clint Dempsey, all these guys I've been looking up to for so long. And Dempsey is still to this day one of the guys that I, I stay in touch with often. Oh, that's amazing. That's really amazing. Well, I, I, I could sort of talk to you about the U.S. national team for, for hours here, but we, we got a couple we got to cover a couple other things. But, you know, talk about your career in Europe, which was which was pretty amazing. I mean, you played. in my understanding, you played in Sweden and Scotland and France um, and you played for some some pretty epic teams as well. Yeah, absolutely. I think when I first, uh, like I said, I had this opportunity to leave early in, in, in from college, from Boston College. Um, I didn't take that opportunity, but uh, I had another player um, who's a really good friend of mine now, one of my best friends, Charlie Davies, who uh, you might have heard of. You know, he had a great talent. Um, he went to BC before I did, and he grad. Uh, he went to he turned pro and went to Sweden. Um, and one of the summers in my junior year, I was able to go to Sweden train with a team out there and, you know, I had some days off. I visited him in Stockholm and that's when I fell in love with, you know, the city of Stockholm, the, the country of Sweden. And, uh, and I, I felt that that was the right step for my career, you know, um, just like it was, you know, where I didn't kind of, um, go to one of the bigger schools initially. And I went to a smaller school, Fairleigh Dickinson and made a name for myself there. I felt that that was a logical step for me 
um, go to Sweden, establish myself, get playing time that I so need. And, you know, I don't want to ride the bench or anything like that. And then, uh, you know, scouts would see and, and my ability and things like that. I believed in myself. And that's what happened. You know, I was able to make the, um, the move to Glasgow Rangers after that. And Glasgow Rangers is a very storied club, great tradition, great history. Um, unfortunately, I didn't go at the best time as they went into administration, which is, you know, the equivalent of bankruptcy here in the States. Um, but my time there was amazing. I spent it with a couple other national team guys in Maurice Adu and Carlos Bocanegra. And, uh, you know, the fan base there is crazy. I mean, uh, Chad could probably talk to you. You know, they have a rivalry. It's called the Old Firm Derby. Um, and it's, you know, it's, it's, it's just more than a soccer rivalry. You know, it goes into politics and religion, you know. <laughs> so there's so much at stake there. And, and the fans are absolutely, uh, uh, as they say, mental. You know, it's just crazy. But uh, they're passionate, man. They're passionate. And it, it's, it's awesome. Uh, and then from there, I, I, I moved back actually to Sweden, to Helsingborg. It was a team that, you know, obviously I knew the Swedish league very well. I felt that if I could take a little step back to go forward again in my career, that would be good. And, you know, I did very well at Helsingborg, uh, played in Champions League, Europa League. Uh, and, you know, we were at the time I left, we were the top team in the league there. Um, and uh, it took me to my next step, took me to France, to FC Nantes. Uh, and that was a great uh, that was a great uh, point in my career. Um, I played there almost four years uh, against some of the best teams in the world. You know, the PSG, Olympic Marseille and, and Olympic Lyon. Uh, and some great, great players, which I'm sure you recognize, you know, at PSG, some guys like Slatan Ibrahimovic, uh, things like that. Uh, and Bappe, who's now there. He was when I was there. He was actually from uh, at Monaco. Uh, but that was just awesome. And I think what gets lost a lot in this is obviously for soccer, it was amazing for my professional career. But I think soccer has enabled me to travel the world like no other. And I've been blessed to be able to go to so many countries and see so many different cultures, try so many different like cuisines and you know, meeting people. And, you know, I think for me, it's, it's made me the player that I am, obviously. Um, but also uh, the, the person that I am. Yeah. I mean, it, it's, it's really amazing. You know, all the different ty- you know, all the different countries you've lived in, as you said, cultures. Um, but then what made you come back to the U S and, and, and the MLS, what kind of, you know, brought you back here? Um, was it was it a, an agent of yours, or was it the MLS itself, or was it something that you wanted to do, or kind of how did how did that all come come to? Yeah, it was, it was a bit hesitant to come back. You know, I had uh, some chances to you know go elsewhere. Um, you know, I had a, a couple of teams from England and even Germany interested, but the way the window, the transfer window worked, MLS closed uh, like August fourth, and the rest of the the, the Europe. Uh, the window closed in, in the end of August, August 30th. So I was kind of in a, in a, in a, in a, um, in a tough situation where like, you know, if I have this MLS situation go by uh, and something doesn't pan out wherever, you know, in England or Germany, then I'm stuck in, you know, not that it was a bad thing to be stuck in France, but, you know, I wanted to take another step, another challenge. And then it was also uh, the birth of my child, uh, Santino, my, my son who was born in France uh, with his birth, you know, as a father, you know, I kind of, my, thinking kind of shifted, you know, I kind of want to be closer to home as well with my family, have my son grow up and, and be part of my family, you know, and, and obviously being in Europe, it was hard for them to get over all the time and, and be there and show their support. But being closer to my family in the States enabled me to have, you know, some help, you know, um, with the, with my with my son. And it was, uh, you know, I thought about it from a family perspective, you know. So I think it was about the, the time that I was ready to come home, you know, and Philadelphia presented a great opportunity and they had some ambitious plans, you know, and, and they saw kind of, uh, I was still in the prime of my career. And, you know, I think um, they saw the possibility of me kind of leading the team, you know, um, forward. And, um, you know, here we are, I think things have gone pretty well. You know, uh, we won the Supporters Shield last year. Um, first trophy in club history and throughout my time here so far we've been able to continue to make history with getting you know the first playoff victory in history and you know make, breaking records with points total in the season and all that and stuff so um, you know I think it was just the right time in terms of you know, I had spent almost 10 years in Europe and you know I was just trying to be closer to home and spend more time with family absolutely I mean so you said you know so how, how old is your son now my son is six now, and I also have a daughter now who's three years old. So, they're the driving force. 
And and your and I understand also your wife was also a professional soccer player as well. She did. She played soccer growing up. Yeah, back in Norway in Bergen, where she's from. So uh, you know, I hope that the, my kids will have some athletic genes as well. <laughs> and do you, do you go out there and sort of kick the ball around with them or? Yeah, definitely. I you know in the city it's a little bit harder to do maybe than living out in the suburbs in Philly. But I think uh, we have a nice little private driveway where we, you know we get, you know you have like the a bucket full of all this athletic stuff, you know, bats and balls and, you know, tennis balls, rackets and, and soccer balls out there in the street. So they, they enjoy that. That's awesome. That's really, that's, that's great. You know, um, again, it, it's, it's really a, a pleasure to have you on our 76 capital leadership series. And you know, we have Ali Bedoya, uh, follow him at Ali Bedoya 17, uh, on Twitter. And, you know, one of the things I, I really wanted to get into um, prior to talking about the fact that, I mean, as we said earlier, you know, Ali, you're the captain of the, the Philadelphia Union. You've had some really great success on the on the field, you know, here in the U.S., in Europe, on the U.S. national team, um, now coming on as our co-chairman of our athlete venture group. But at the same time, you have really gotten yourself kind of in the middle of some really important you know, philanthropic as well as social justice initiatives. Um, you know, wh why do you do those things? Why, what, 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 what's, is it something inside? Is it something from you when you grew up? Or is it just something that you just said, you know, I, I got I to gotta, I gotta do something about this? I think it was a little bit of both of everything, right? You know, how I was raised and how I, how I grew up. Um, but over the, the my career, I think, you know, like I said, I've been able to travel to so many different places. Uh, but I always made it a habit of myself to whenever I, I went somewhere to a new country that I try to act by myself. I try to, you know, uh, learn the language where I'm at and, and, you know, kind of get out of my comfort zone. Right. Because I think, you know, when you make yourself vulnerable, it's not, vulnerability is not a weakness. I think that's the biggest strength you can have is is to become vulnerable and, and really see something else for what it's not. And when you go out of your comfort zone, you really learn a lot about yourself. So when I'm seeing different things and 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 I think going to Europe really opened my eyes and gave me a whole new perspective on, on the world, you know, um, uh, the way people live and things like that. So when I, you know, overseas, I think one of the social justice initiatives, obviously, that I've been a part of recently is obviously the gun violence, right? Um, you might be familiar with that viral moment after I scored a goal, uh, you know, whatever came hit my head that weekend, you know, that was the, 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 the El, El Paso shooting and also Dayton shooting on a Saturday and a Sunday. And so that was all that was on my mind. And it was just a spontaneous moment. I grabbed the mic and, you know, I shouted to Congress to let's, you know, try to end gun violence. And um, you know, I grew up in Weston and, and the town over from me is, is Parkland and there was a Parkland shooting and that hit, I mean, that hit real close to home. You know, I had a teammate here in Philly who lost his best friend in that shooting. So all these things, they're all encompassing, right? And, and they have an impact on you. And, you know, I think it was Nelson Mandela who had a quote, you know, sports have the power to change the world. And they really do. You know, sports bring people together from all over. Um, and through sports, uh, as an athlete, I feel like uh, it's just not enough to to just play a sport and and you know it's not a it's not a responsibility i don't feel like but i feel like I, i'm responsible and i have a, an obligation to make an impact in my community in the city that i'm playing for you know now i've been in philly almost five years uh, so i feel like i'm a philadelphia man at heart now you know like i want to be able to help the people around me and, and help my city you know the city and the communities and things like that so um, it, it's just something that i guess comes to me naturally you know um that I want to leave behind a legacy that's not just a midfielder, you know, a, a player, a soccer player, you know, it's, it's one that includes somebody that was had was able to make an impact on in their community, you know, uh, in, in the children, in the future generations, you know, whether it's, uh, you know, making a difference with gun violence or making a difference uh, in the business world, you know, with 76 Capital and investing in different entrepreneurs or um, and businesses. So I think that's just something that for me, it's, it's just innate, you know, and I, I have no problem doing that. Um, and it, I, it's something that I'm passionate about. And I think it's important. Yeah, it, it, well, it certainly is, and it's certainly something that make you know is is really important to us at Seventy Six Capital. And I think that you know one of the things I, I'm I'm wondering is when you do this and you do these off the field um, type of initiatives and 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 use your um, social capital to 
you know, try to make this world a better place. Can you see, or see other players, whether it's on your team or other teammates or team members that kind of say, well, wait a second, you know what, if, if Ollie's doing this, I can do this. And like, maybe, maybe I, I should, I should get behind this or maybe, you know, have, have you seen others kind of been able to kind of get behind you because you've been the one who's kind of stepped out or grabbed the mic and said, Hey, I, this is an important issue. I think definitely when, when you do acts like that and things like that, I think you empower, uh, you know, your locker room. You know, you talk about creating a culture, whether it's in a company or, or, or uh, here as a team. You know, you know, when you're in that locker room, you have guys from, you know, I think there's 14 different nations represented here in our team and there's a lot of youth. And um, So when you bring all that diversity, right, and you do something like that, it really empowers uh, the whole locker room, right, to feel like they – you know, like they can stand up for what they believe in and they they have the freedom to, you know, express themselves and they're, they they become more comfortable right within the locker room because a lot of guys maybe are shy or maybe don't feel like they can express themselves a certain way. But I would say that in the past, you know, we have some some great athletes, some great leaders, some great people in, in, in my locker room, you know, and last year I can speak for, you know, guys like Ray Gaddis, uh, uh, Warren Creval, Mark McKenzie. These are guys who are out there, you know, uh, putting themselves out, you know, becoming vulnerable uh, and and kind of um, trying to make a difference in their communities here, whether it's in Chester, you know, our stadiums out here in Chester and the Chester community, but also in Philly. And I think that speaks volumes about their character and what they're all about as people. And I think, um, you know, it's it's not for everybody and that's OK. I understand that. But I think for those who 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 maybe are a little bit shy or more quiet, I think definitely it helps to have people like myself and those guys um, to help break the mold of maybe, you know, being hesitant or, or being shy, you know? Well, it's certainly something that we've noticed and it's a leadership trait that, um, you know, is, is really is really important, um, truly just to make this world a better place. And, and that's not just a little thing, obviously. I mean, you know, it was one of the reasons why I understand that, you know, the, the MLS and Don Garber thought it would be great for you to be part of the Athletes' Voices at Harvard with Joanne Pasternak. And, you know, luckily, I'm, I'm also a member of, of that group as well with, with you in that. And, you know, really excited about this idea of being able to empower and help this next generation of athletes um, and, and help them go out there and use their voice to, to make change and, and make this world a better place. So hopefully this summer, um, you know, things, you know, get better and we can actually be on campus at, at, at Harvard together up in Boston. Uh, that would be really special. That would be great. Yeah, Joanne's a great person. And, you know, some of the athletes that I've been able to interact through her and everything, it's amazing. You know, like I said, uh, sports, you know, we speak a language that connects with people, you know, from certain community, certain community, community, sorry, um, that is able to to have a lasting impact. And I think the more uh, social capital that athletes realize that they have and continue to use as leverage, I think the more impact we can we can have as we're able to connect with uh, a more diverse group of people. Well, Ali, you know it's it's been it, it's it's really great to to have you on our show. And you know what obviously today we really wanted to talk about the fact that, you know, you are now coming on board um, of, of our 76 Capital Athlete Venture Group as the co-chairman, along with um, the, the chairman, uh, Brian Westbrook, from the Philadelphia Eagles. And you're with the Philadelphia Union. And it's just really exciting that to have you uh, in that. And what what attracted you? Um, you know, other than, of course, you know, my partner, Chad Stender, who's who really understands this game of soccer and who is someone who is super passionate about the, the overall you know, um, game and, and, and the culture and is someone that is, is, it really enjoys, he's, he's, he's been telling me about the relationship that you guys have built, but what was overall from an athlete venture, um, venture group perspective, you know, attracted you to be wanting to, part, be wanting, to wanting to be a part of this and not only being a part of it, but also being one of the leaders? Yeah, definitely. I think just as we spoke to earlier with the social justice initiatives, you know, I, I, I wanted to work with the right kind of people that are, you know, building companies that could make a big impact on the world or or connecting with guys like Brian Westbrook and Chad Stender, who are, are you know, kind of both uh, love sports, are in the sports world and also, you know, business minded. Um, so when I 
uh, when I first met Chad, we connected on, you know, on various levels, but I think uh, he saw where, you know, that kind of our visions kind of align, right? And, um, you know, continue to work with Chad and, and now with Brian uh, at the ABG and Athlete Venture Group, you know, uh, is going to be tremendous. I think obviously our main goal now is to grow it out, um, uh, to obviously help 76 Capital continue to grow its portfolio companies as well. But it's it's continuing that 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 trend of of making an impact, making a difference, right? So for I would consider that all the prospects for ABG that we, we consider, you know, um, you want to be get involved, you know, get involved in, in as, as to the level that you're comfortable with, you know. I think uh, we're going to be focusing on uh, together with our investment team, you know, yourself, Wayne, um, Chad, John, uh, James, also who, everybody at 76 Capital. To uh, you know, screen potential investments. You know, uh, doing uh, uh, proper due diligence um, with them, uh, and ultimately, if you invest, that's fine. You know, but I think you're going to be able to help companies grow, but you're going to be able to help your brand grow as an athlete. You know, as as we leverage our our you know our athlete name. You know, throughout our careers. You know, I think. I think the career in, as an NFL player is a lot shorter than the average, you know, soccer player because as a soccer player, it's a worldwide game. There's many, many more options for you, but it's important that um, as athletes, as we become more knowledgeable, as we continue to use our social capital, which is very important, um, and then we have the financial means too to invest, that we um, that we do it in 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 a good, smart way. And the AVG together with you know Chad and Brian Westbrook, I think. We all have a, a keen understanding of, you know, uh, a sense of business, you know, a good business acumen that will be able to help other prospective athletes. And it's not just athletes. I think Athlete Venture Group is the name we went with, but athletes as ourselves, we, you know, we're influencers, we're celebrities. So that goes for other influencers and celebrities as well that would be willing to join us. Um, and, you know, I think with the connections that we made, um, I'm a big guy on, on relationships, I think, in, in all aspects of life. Uh, networking is, is, is big. Um, I've never been a guy that's been shy, you know, even that's how I met Chad is when I first moved to Philly, you know, I wanted to find a company that, you know, that was willing to invest in, in entrepreneurs and things like that. And, and, and I found you guys and I just reached out to Chad, you know, hey, and, and we ended up linking up at Nurtry Gamers at, at, at an event that you guys hosted out there with one of your portfolio companies. So you hit it off. And, you know, next thing you know, is you, you re realize that there's people out there that uh, are willing to to be mentors for you, right? They're willing to offer you um, advice, guys like yourself, Wayne, and things like that. And you lean on that, right? And with the athlete venture group, I think that's another thing that we're we're going to be open to is, is is guys to be a part of the group that will be able to make introductions to other executives. Um, uh, you know, whether it's helping to create uh, marketing content. Uh, or showing up to support like I did, you know, showing up uh, at an event like, you know, uh, Nurtry Gamers and, you know, esports and, uh, you know, it was at one of the at FIFA event, you know, so I was able to play there and get to meet others. So it, it, the Athlete Venture Group, I think, is, is going to be able to offer so much to, to a lot of people. And, um, you know, on the side also uh, for athletes um, is being able to get some, you know, interview and speaking opportunities at, um, at different events that, that can further uh, that uh, specific person's brand, you know, uh, that makes them more than just an athlete, you know, uh, that makes them more of a, you know, I think Brian Westbrook is pretty much considered, you know, a former Eagles player and now a businessman, right? And I think that's important for a lot of us now as we, um, you know, mature in, in our careers. Well, you know, one of the things which I think is, is, is really amazing where, and, and one of the things we've seen with with guys like Brian Westbrook, and and when we're able to introduce, and whether it's us or even Brian bringing opportunities, you know, to us at Seventy Six Capital, when you bring together the athlete and the entrepreneur, there's this kind of magic that happens. And one of the things that Brian loves to talk about is that the fact that you have similar kinds of traits, and basically personality traits are similar to being a top athlete, are very, very similar to being a top um, business person or entrepreneur, whether that's perseverance or being able to have that drive or desire or pen passion to go make things happen. You know, this, this the persistence, again, that, that, you know, this thing we mentioned earlier about getting knocked down and then just getting back up. 
are, are, have you seen those types of things in the types of businesses that you've been involved with? And are those some of the things that you're excited about getting involved with the companies that, that we have at 76 Capital? Yeah, absolutely. I think obviously perseverance is a big part of it. I, I, I think resilience as well. You know, I think as an entrepreneur in a startup, you know, there could be so many times when you turn down for, for funding from, from various sources, right? And, and it might be a lot of negative and things like that, but it's important that you remain resilient and you persevere. You try to persevere, keep going and then keep trying um, and keep pushing forward. And I think that's something that drives me as an athlete now, even as an older player now you know i always say like the next youth player coming up is here to take your spot well they better earn it right like i'm going to keep fighting for that in my spot right and uh it's the same thing as a, as a business owner as an entrepreneur um you got to keep that drive going and i think as now as i try to get ready to prepare myself for life after soccer um that's what i see in, in business and uh, you know kind of in the vc world um it's that spark you know what what keeps me uh, when i wake up in the morning what keeps me going right now is obviously my drive is to to keep performing at a very high level um but also with, with the business world i see you know in the different uh, businesses that i'm involved with um it's that spark where like i have to wake up look in my emails and whatever it is that it, whether it's good or bad news in the morning like I'm, i i gotta persevere for the day and i gotta make turn that negative into a positive or you know if it, i get another t uh you know i'm on the advisory board of a um at clients a new company um and it's just kind of you know you get turned down from certain um funding opportunities but it's okay listen i got this other guy or i got this other company let's let's get to them and let's 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 you know give them our deck and let's pitch it to them and you know we can make it happen and you you find out your, your true character you know you find out what you're all about and and, and who's really willing to come with you and down in the trenches right so to speak um so i think there's very a lot of similarities a lot of parallels um, from the business and the sports world, you know, I can think about it. I maybe, I don't know if it will make sense, but I think about it like in the soccer world, you know, I think the soccer world is so different in the way the transfers work, the way guys are, um, go from team to team and how much, uh, some clubs are willing to pay for some players, you know, and I think about it as a soccer player, like, uh, let's take Brendan Aronson last year for an example from the Philadelphia union. You know, if you look at him as like a company, as a startup, like he signs, you know, with the youth academy, he's in the academy, you know, you get different like, um, I guess, seed funding as he grows up through the academy. And then all of a sudden he signs that first uh, team contract that's like the Series A and you're trying to get him to all these different verticals, working on his technical part of the game, working on his tactical uh, awareness those are like the different verticals and all of a sudden there's an, uh, a possibility for an exit as he gets the series B funding and whatever it is. And boom, he exits, you know, you get that exit when he gets transferred to a big club, you know, for $12 million, you know, uh, I guess on a smaller scale, obviously, but that's how kind of I see, you know, and with that soccer mind and business mind, you know, uh, that connectivity, but there's, a, there's definitely a lot of parallels to, to be drawn from, and, you know, the athletes world to, to business. Oh, no doubt. No doubt. I mean, when you think about, you know, your career so far and as we start to, you know, wind down our, our, our Seven Six Capital Leadership Series show here and kind of coming to the end of what we're doing, here, you know, this this show. But, you know, we think about your career so far, you know, is there one moment or is there something that you're most proud of that you've done so far? Or is there or maybe it's something that you, you really are looking, you know, you hope to be able to do in the future? Um, what, what, do you, what do you kind of think about right now as that? Oh, yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think, uh, obviously, you know, the birth of my two kids changed everything, you know, uh, a new family man. But I think uh, I think meeting my, my wife, you know, um, she's from Norway, Norwegian, like I said earlier, I mentioned that living in Europe, being in Europe really changed my perspective on a lot of things. It allowed me to come out of the USA and see a lot of things for for different ways, different reasons, different ways of living. Um, so for me, I still have never lost that drive. You know, I have that competitive edge, that willingness to persevere, that resilience that I think is very much needed in the business world as well. But uh, having my kids, I think, have has even strengthened that to a certain level, right? Because I want to allow my kids to live an even better life than I did. So I think that drive is even further entrenched to me to, to help others. And I think I got to thank my wife for that because she's got – a much bigger heart than I do. Um, always willing to help others, and I think 
that's where that drive comes in, where I love to be a part of those entrepreneurs and those uh, uh, working with the right people that are building those those kind of companies that are going to be transformational. And in doing that, I'm able to help other people out. But also, obviously, we're all in here to, to make money as well. And that's what you do as a VC that I can help further uh, you know, my, uh, my kids life and, and their lifestyles and things like that. So that's something that I think about often. Well, I, I'm excited that we'll get a chance to think about these things together. Um, as you are now, you know, our co-chairman of our 76 capital athlete venture group, um, again, working, you know, hand in hand with Brian Westbrook and, and my partner, Chad Stender, it's going to be really exciting for you and, and for all of us to work together, try to build these next generation businesses, work with entrepreneurs, help them achieve their goals. As we like to say at 76 Capital, you know, make the impossible possible um, and, and really just do some, do some incredible things together. So Ali, it's been, it's been great having you uh, as a guest on our 76 Capital Leadership Series. As I mentioned earlier, definitely follow Ali Bedoya17 uh, on Twitter. And, uh, you know, hit up Ali, hit up us at 76 Capital. If because if you're an entrepreneur, an athlete, a student, a business person, you know, you want to work in this amazing new sports tech world, whether it's in the sports betting world, esports world, or just, you know, something new within the within the sports world. Look what's happened within the media world with the NFL, this hundred plus billion dollar deal. I mean, this industry is white hot and we want to talk with you if you really have an idea or you want to even you know, work for one of the companies that we're involved with, please reach out to us and we'd love to connect with you. So again, Ali, thank you so much for joining us on our show. Wayne, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. And you know, I look forward to being able to hopefully come in the office soon when this pandemic is over and, and interact more. But I'm looking forward to, you know, thank you guys for including me as part of the AVG co-chairman and uh, I'm really looking forward to, to everything we've we got going on. Absolutely. So once again, I'm Wayne Kimmel. And again, thanks for tuning in for this edition of our 76 Capital Leadership Series. And as Ali would say, get out there and go make it happen. Yes, sir.